All right. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. I'm really excited to be here um, and have a kind of captain audience to lecture about pigeons. Um, I'm going to be talking about my uh, doctoral work. So the work that I've been doing over the last four years, um, looking at the kind of biological phenomenon of extinction by hybridization, which is a conservation issue that has been a little bit neglected and looking at it in the undomesticated or wild rock dove which is perhaps a, an animal that has also been a little bit neglected. So hopefully there's something of interest to all of us here uh, in this talk. So I, I wanted to start because uh, most of this talk is me being a bit down about hybridization and the kind of negatives of it. So I wanted to just highlight uh, why it's important uh, in conservation and evolutionary biology. Um, and hybridization was perhaps for a long time uh, seen as something that was a little bit odd in nature, a little bit unusual, and perhaps not overly important uh, in evolutionary terms. But over the past few decades, we have become increasingly aware that none of that's true. So animals and plants, hybridization is very common. Uh, in birds, about a fifth of species are known to have hybridized with at least one other species. And um, if we look at the waterfowl, this figure by Jente Ottenbergs, um, they're particularly um, prolific uh, interbreeding between different species. So each of the nodes here is a species and the connections between the nodes highlight who's hybridizing with who. And kind of intuitively, this is a really good way of sharing genetic diversity amongst uh, different species. And genetic diversity is often said to be the fuel for adaptive selection. So that makes it kind of a positive thing uh, in many ways, a positive uh, fuel for evolution. And um, other than this kind of uh, perhaps relatively simple, intuitive concept of sharing genetic diversity, there are also more uh, dramatic impacts of hybridization. Um, so in Darwin's finches recently, there's been a new lineage called the big bird lineage, which formed by two different species of uh, Darwin's finches hybridizing together, uh, which is very, very cool. Um, on the other hand, uh, and this is where hybridization, uh, I get a bit down on it, uh, as we humans have been moving around the world, and maybe as British people in the past century, we're kind of particularly guilty of this, we have been moving animals and plants to come into contact with different species or different genetically distinct populations uh, that they had not in the past been in contact with, and um, giving them the opportunity to kind of fall in love and make babies um, in a way that they hadn't before. So one example of this, um, which is up here, is in the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean. We have these two species of iguana. We have uh, the green iguana, which is introduced, which is iguana iguana. And we have iguana de delicatissima, uh, which is the Lesser Antillean endemic iguana, which confusingly looks less delicate than the green iguana, making it difficult to remember which is which. Um, but essentially what you can see from this piece of work here is that when we compare the 1960s distribution of these species and the 2015 distribution, wherever the green iguana has colonized or been introduced, the lesser Antillean iguana has been lost um, and it's now critically endangered. And given that with an increase in tropical storms and things, the green iguana is now also able to kind of raft between islands without us directly assisting it. The persistence of the lesser Antillean iguana is kind of completely dependent on human monitoring for new incursions. And that's obviously a really bad uh, place to be if you're an animal, because it means that uh, its entire existence is dependent on us as human beings, generating funding to monitor it and maintaining interest, um, which is not a guarantee. A little bit closer to home, um, an example that uh, turns up a lot in the media in the UK is Scotland's wildcat. So the, the Scottish wildcat is a relic population of what was originally a much bigger Great British wide population of the European wildcat. Um, and we have kind of eradicated most of them. And then we have proceeded also to eradicate most of the Scottish wildcats due to things like conflicts with gamekeeping. Um, and what this meant was that the Scottish wildcat by numbers was so small that the average wildcat was much more likely to meet and interbreed with a feral or domestic cat. And this has been called the desperation hypothesis. Um, and therefore, in recent decades, the, the conservation and genetic status of the wildcat has become kind of hotly debated 
And we had lots of papers sort of in the past 20, 30 years looking at different aspects of morphology or um, pelage criteria, the, the coat patterning of the cats. Um, you can see a nice one in the middle here. And this is basically to help conservationists look at camera trap videos or look at cats in the wild and try to work out what the actual population size of this animal is, um, which has kind of not overly helped to, to solve this problem of establishing the conservation status of this animal. Uh, what has started to help is that in recent years, uh, genomic technologies have advanced in whole genome sequencing. And we've been able to analyze the extent of different ancestry components within these cats to, to look at what percentage wild cat or what percentage feral cat they are essentially. Um, and so one example of this is Helen Sen's work from 2019 uh, from the Wild Genes Lab in Edinburgh. And what they did was they sampled different categories of this wild cat, so ones in zoos, um, historical specimens from museums from the past sort of century, uh, which is putatively before there was this massive hybridization, um, and also contemporary samples, which are either from roadkill or from monitoring projects where they're trapping these cats to study their populations. Um, and what they did was they looked at the DNA and they were able to assign each individual what they called a Q score, um, which is uh, essentially looking at its ancestry. So one would be an unadmixed wild cat and zero would be an unadmixed feral or domestic cat. And they then ranked all of the individuals. Um, and so if you look at these two plots here, the top one is for the museum specimens. Um, and we can see that in the ranking, they all come out near the top. They all have a Q score, or the majority of them are near one. Um, so the, at this point, the wild cat was quite genetically distinctive. Um, although we can see that some of them are starting to drop near to 0 0.75. So evidently there was some feral uh, cat gene flow at this time. Um, but it stands out massively in comparison to the contemporary cats, where if we look at the bottom uh, plot, we can see that they're all falling, or most of them between 0 0.25 and 0.75, um, which means that all of them have heavily mixed ancestry, um, and we don't have any wild cats uh, left in the wild that persist with a high Q score. And this led Helen Sen and others to declare that the, the wild living Scottish wild cat population was functionally extinct. And so conservation effort for this uh, entity today uh, essentially revolves around reintroducing them from zoo populations or from continental European populations. And so the, the wild cat is an example of kind of quite a select group uh, of animals, which is the wild ancestors or the wild uh, close relatives of domesticated animals. Um, and these are a very exciting group of animals. Um, they are kind of akin to the wild relatives of crop plants, which have attracted quite a lot of interest scientifically um, because they benefit us as humans. So if we think about certain traits like salinity resistance or temperature resistance, um, there's interest in trying to introduce those traits into crop plants, which will help us to deal with things like mitigating climate change's uh, impact on global food security. But um, undomesticated animals have kind of um, escaped this interest to an extent. So we wrote a review uh, a couple of years ago trying to draw attention um, to these animals and their conservation status and, and why they're all quite cool. Um, and what we found was that they are kind of particularly at risk of this um, idea of extinction by hybridization where um, their domestic relatives are so closely related to them and are often so common in a feral form uh, that often the, the genetic status of these wild forms of domestic animals is often very dubious nowadays. We don't really know much about it. So these are three um, domesticated bird uh, wild relatives. You have the, the red jungle fowl, which is the, the main wild ancestor of the domestic chicken. Um, we have the grey egg goose, which is the wild form of one of two forms of domestic goose that exist. And you have the mallard, which is the wild form of one of two forms of domestic duck that exist. Um, and basically all of these species, much like the wild cat, for a very long time, what we had was this kind of uh, looking at plumage and maybe commenting, look, some feral traits are turning up here um, and trying to establish their genetic status that way. Um, and again, it's only really been with the development of whole genome sequencing and DNA analysis that we've started to get a handle on this. Um, so you can see underneath each one, there have been recent papers um, which have analyzed the DNA of these animals and of their feral relatives. 
Uh, and for all of them, what they've shown is that hybridization has been very, very extensive. Um, they've been mixing with feral domestic populations for a very long time. And in some populations, this is of uh, sort of conservation uh, relevance. For example, when they looked at Singaporean red jungle fowl, um, it became clear that they were what's known as a hybrid swarm population where all individuals have admixed ancestry. And so the kind of uh, unadmixed red jungle fowl has ceased to exist as a, as a distinct entity. Now, the most exciting and interesting of all of the domesticated birds is the domestic pigeon. Um, and it comes from a bird called the wild rock dove. Uh, we domesticated the wild rock dove between five and 10,000 years ago, uh, somewhere between the east of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, although we're not exactly sure where. Um, wild rock doves originally were distributed across kind of vast swathes of Europe, across North Africa, uh, through the Middle East, into Asia, down to sort of Sri Lanka. Um, and we domesticated them mainly as a source of food because their kind of superpower is that they're capable of breeding all throughout the year. So it's a really good source of protein um, for us as humans, which a lot of wild birds have more of a defined breeding season. Um, as Europeans, I guess we're not as familiar today with this species as a food source, although there are many parts of the world where they are an economically important food source. So in China, there's lots of big kind of industrial scale factory farming of the species for food. Um, we are more familiar with them as uh, domestic racing pigeons. Um, so this pigeon at the top here sold for about a million euros uh, a few years ago. Um, for somebody who clearly had that much money to spend on a pigeon. Um, and we are also more familiar with them as the fancy pigeon. So there are many different varieties of fancy pigeon which originate all across uh, where we have kept domestic pigeons in the past. Um, depending on your taste of birds, they either look horrific or beautiful. Uh, this is a frillback pigeon. Um, and many, many of these domesticated animals that we've been keeping have been escaping for hundreds of years. Uh, and a lot of them would kind of die very quickly. So this frillback pigeon here, um, I assume would become a very expensive meal for a peregrine falcon very quickly. But others um, have managed to survive and form what we call feral pigeon populations. Uh, and feral pigeons are one of the most abundant birds in the world. Um, they're very well adapted to urban environments. It's a bird that we're all kind of intimately familiar with, although maybe it's fair to say many people would not be particularly big fans of them. Um, but they're very fascinating and they've adapted really well to living alongside us as human beings. Um, as the feral pigeon has expanded in its population, and as the uh, domestic pigeon has continued to escape, uh, they have been coming into contact with wild type rock doves out on cliffs and caves and things, um, and they've been hybridizing with them. And this has rendered the status of the rock dove in conservation terms, in genetic terms, uh, a bit of a mystery for quite a long time. So if we think about where we are at with the rock dove's uh, conservation and genetic status, what we know about it, um, up until I started looking at them, there have been no whole genome studies, which uh, we've had for maybe some of these more uh, popular animals like jungle fowls and wild cats and wolves. Um, there, are, there are some uh, existing facts about rock doves. If you read bird books, for example, uh, in Britain, they will often say we have rock dove populations, relic populations in North Scotland and in the west of Ireland. Um, and a lot of that is based on things like uh, certain assumptions we make uh, regarding plumage patterns or regarding head morphology, um, neither of which have been confirmed genetically um, to actually be particularly useful. Um, and then finally, if you look at books or papers which kind of tangentially mention the wild rock dove, the more recent ones are much more likely to have a sentence uh, which kind of gets blended through a thesaurus in multiple papers that says something along the lines of any extant rock dove populations which exist are likely to be very heavily impacted now by feral wild admixture. So sort of like the wild cat or the Singaporean jungle fowl. So I wanted to, to sort of briefly talk about where we got our current understanding of uh, the rock dove's uh, status before uh, my work started. Um, and this comes on a simple assumption based on plumage. So if you look at the, the picture of the flock uh, of rock doves up here, um, this is a, a flock uh, that is in uh, a field in Bernaray in the Outer Hebrides, north of North US. Uh, and there's about, I don't know, 40 rock doves there. 
and they all look basically the same. They all have what is known as blue bar plumage to pigeon fanciers. Uh, it's this nice kind of slate gray pattern with two black wing bars. Um, the Western populations native to Europe and North Africa have a white rump patch, um, which is not present in the kind of Indian populations, uh, but they all have this very nice uh, iridescent patch on the neck, which is being modeled by this very well behaved rock dove from Uist. Normally they're not that happy. Um, this is a massive difference to if you walk around London today and you see feral pigeons. Uh, and if you look at them closely enough, you'll see that everyone is in some way slightly different to every other feral pigeon. Mm -hmm. um, and this plumage polymorphism is far more than is, is seen in any other wild bird in Europe. So we have maybe there's a couple of morphs of cuckoo color, there's a couple of morphs of tawny owl color in Europe, there's a couple of morphs of guillemots, you have bridled guillemots and non bridled guillemots, but feral pigeons kind of take it very far. And these are all um, feral pigeons that we've caught either in Oxford uh, or in Leicestershire uh, as part of my work. So you can kind of categorize uh, the different plumages that exist. Uh, the most common is the checker and the tea check um, patterning. And that was introduced uh, under domestication uh, with hybridization with the African speckled pigeon, which gives it kind of the speckling on the wings. Um, but you have lots of different colors like red and red check and white. What makes this confusing because uh, intuitively, this is kind of a great way of telling the difference between rock doves and feral pigeons. Uh, but it's confused by the fact that a lot of feral pigeons, probably about a fifth in most flocks, have the wild type or blue bar plumage. Um, so if you see this one in particular, it even has a white rump. So it's kind of a lot of people would say this is indistinguishable um, from the wild rock dove. And yet, because of these uh, plumage-based assumptions, we do have a general idea of where these wild rock doves uh, still persist. Um, so this is taken from eBird, and it's where people this year um, have reported what they uh, have decided are undomesticated wild rock doves. Um, we can kind of uh, dismiss a few places uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, places like Mongolia or Northeastern Europe have never been within the presumed range of the wild rock dove. So these are just people getting very overly excited by wild type feral pigeons. Um, and then other places we can dismiss for different reasons. So for example, in mainland Italy, it's known that um, feral pigeons have been around for a very long time and there are no populations left with a high proportion of individuals which have wild type plumage. Um, although there are potentially some uh, off of the mainland. But this still leads um, lots of different places where we have flocks of wild living pigeons that have a high proportion of individuals with this wild type blue bar plumage. Um, so these are all very interesting places to potentially start to look at the genetics of these birds. Uh, I decided to study the UK and uh, to a lesser extent the Republic of Ireland uh, for a number of reasons. One being I'm from the UK and uh, logistically, uh, financially, it therefore made sense. Um, but other than that, if you do look at percentage of birds in flocks with wild type plumage, some of the most promising populations are in places like the Outer Hebrides of Scotland. So those are places I really wanted to look at. Uh, and then another reason is Britain has kind of a particularly strong tradition of, uh, in inverted commas, gentlemen naturalists. Uh, so we have lots of kind of uh, old writings about these populations of wild living pigeons and about feral pigeons. So it's a really good place um, as a genomicist to have a nice baseline of information to start to work on. So the, the first thing that I wanted to do was look at, uh, I did a mini sort of citizen science project and people sent in pictures of pigeon flocks um, or individual pigeons from all over the UK and a little bit of the Republic of Ireland as well. Um, and I looked at two different things. The first thing that I wanted to look at was the uh, morphology of the head, uh, which crops up in the literature a bit as something that's potentially different between wild and feral pigeons. And I'll talk about it a bit later. Uh, and the second thing is the percentage of birds in each flock with wild type plumage. And so it's quite a distinctive pattern. And the gentleman naturalist view of this is indicated with the dashed line. Uh, and you can see that we sort of agree with it. We have these populations with a high number of individuals with wild type plumage out in the north and west of Scotland. Um, for the Republic of Ireland, we don't have as much data, but it's kind of generally understood that any relic populations would be restricted to the west coast. 
Um, if you look in uh, at kind of the variation in plumage uh, polymorphism, you can see some places like uh, Orkney here um, have some populations which do have a very high percentage of birds with wild type plumage, but other populations kind of, it's a lot more variable. And what this suggests is that maybe those populations are currently mixing with feral pigeons. Um, but then the Outer Hebrides stands out as almost all of the uh, populations that we got data for had almost 100% wild type plumage. So that was potentially very exciting to look at. Um, so this is a picture from Valley Island, which is off of North Uist in the Outer Hebrides, where there's a, about 100 to 150 rock doves living in big derelict buildings, uh, and not one of them has a, a non-wild type plumage. So that was a, a very interesting population that we wanted to investigate further. And yet, despite all of this work, you still basically have this sentence repeated throughout the literature, which says that morphologically, we can't actually tell the difference between wild rock doves and feral pigeons. So we can't actually make a kind of sensible conclusion uh, regarding the range of the wild form or its contemporary conservation status. You then get follow-up statements like this, uh, which say the existence of pure wild populations uncontaminated by domestics or ferals is questionable. Um, and you won't hear me use the word pure and contaminated in the rest of this talk because I don't think it's particularly helpful to refer to hybridization and, and natural processes as in such emotive language. Um, but I do think it is important that uh, unadmixed populations of rock doves are protected where possible um, because they will be lost and that's the loss of genetic diversity within the species. Um, but obviously some feral pigeon ancestry does not make something contaminated as such. Um, so why study wild rock doves? There are kind of a number of reasons for me um, why this is a very cool animal and a very cool opportunity to do some interesting science. Um, the first is that a lot of the wild forms of domestic animals uh, like aurochs or tarpon are extinct um, and other populations like jungle fowl uh, or wildcats in many places are very extensively hybridized. If the um, genetic status of the rock dove kind of matches the uh, plumage status, which we've just looked at um, in the British Isles, then this would be a really interesting system where we have different populations with different histories of feral pigeon presence, which would be a really good case study with which to ask uh, deeper questions about this process of extinction by hybridization. Uh, and the more we can understand this process, the more we can learn about how to kind of mitigate its impacts uh, across more than just this one species. Um, the kind of second reason um, is that the rock dove and, and the species in general, including the domestic pigeon, is a very important part of our history and culture. So we have a five to 10,000 year long relationship uh, with this animal. Um, it crops up in mythology a lot. So Aphrodite, the goddess of love in ancient Greece, was associated with doves. The Holy Spirit is often depicted as a dove. Um, more recently, messenger pigeons during World War II saved hundreds of lives and often won kind of awards. Um, so it's a it's kind of a big gap in our understanding of this species overall that we know very, very little about the wild form, um, which is out there living in the cliffs and caves and things. So it's quite a, a fun opportunity, I think. And then the final reason is the domestic pigeon um, has a, kind of a big role in science as a model organism. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that here. So Darwin, uh, who is up there on the wall, uh, was very interested in pigeons uh, and used them as a, a model system to discuss uh, artificial selection and, and how we could get all of these crazy looking fancy pigeon breeds um, from this one species. Uh, since then, scientists have used domestic pigeons um, to look at lots of different questions as a model organism. So particularly, they've played an important role in uh, cognition, uh, navigation, uh, things like that, aspects of animal behavior. Um, and increasingly, uh, they're being used by people looking at functional genomics and developmental genomics in America. Um, feral pigeons um, have been also a little bit neglected, sort of like rock doves, but in the past five or 10 years, they've really picked up steam and, and interest as a model to look at urban evolution and look at conflict between humans and wildlife. Um, and basically that means we have an enormous uh, body of literature for feral and domestic pigeons. And these papers up here are just some examples uh, published mostly within the last decade. Um, but every year there's hundreds of papers on these. Um, if you look at the wild rock dove, there have never been in the history of science this many papers um, as, a, as is on the board right now. 
uh, looking solely on rock doves or focused on rock doves. So again, it's a really big gap in our understanding of this species. Um, and hopefully, if we can learn more about rock doves, then it will enhance our understanding of, of value of this model organism, um, because we'll be able to look at how the phenomena and the traits that we're studying in captivity kind of act in the wild, like the evolutionary value, the ecological value of these traits. So the, the important questions uh, coming into the, the rock dove system where we basically knew very little um, is first of all, do we still have an extant wild living lineage uh, of this species that is genetically different from contemporary feral and domestic birds? Uh, the second question is, if we do have this wild lineage, are any of these populations not uh, extensively hybridized uh, with domestic and feral pigeons? And then finally, Moving on from the genetics, is it possible to physically tell the difference between rock doves and feral pigeons? Um, because that would help to unlock uh, opportunities for further work. So I, uh, as part of my PhD, I set up this uh, genetics-led uh, study of this species in the British Isles. Uh, we got DNA samples from 233 individual birds and body measurements from 149. Uh, the, the DNA kind of data set um, included all of the main types of this species. So first of all, we had about 40 different domestic breeds of all these different fancy and racing pigeons, uh, which was taken from publicly available genomic data sequenced by uh, Mike Shapiro at a lab in the University of Utah in the States. Um, and so those breeds originated from all over the world. Some were from England, for example, some were from different places in the Middle East. Um, we also sampled, um, an opportunity presented itself to sample uh, birds from private and public zoological collections in the Netherlands. We had about eight different places where birds were being kept in aviaries that were claimed to be wild, undomesticated rock doves. So we were really keen to look at them because it could have been like the wildcat, that these were a very uh, important kind of arc population for conservation. And then all of the, the other um, birds that we sampled came from across the British Isles. So the, the feral pigeons were sampled from various places in England, from the Isle of Man, and also from a population in Lerwick, in the port town uh, in Shetland, uh, which is currently mixing with the wild rock doves and is the most northerly feral pigeon population in the UK. Uh, the, the wild living uh, populations, the wild rock doves were sampled uh, often in collaboration with British Trust for Ornithology licensed bird ringers. Um, so we were very lucky to get help from those people. Um, for example, in the Republic of Ireland, Sam Bailey at Cape Clear Bird Observatory managed to get us some birds. So we were able to include these Irish populations of rock dove. Um, and then I kind of went up to Scotland on, on excursions and filled in the gaps, chasing pigeons around in, in lovely places like Shetland, Orkney, the Inner Hebrides and the Outer Hebrides. Uh, and people often ask, how do you catch a feral pigeon? Um, and it's very different to, to catching any other kind of bird as a bird ringer. Uh, it's quite nice for me because I'm not very patient in uh, sitting and waiting for birds to go into mist nets. Essentially, what you do is you find the busy place in a town or city, which is where the feral pigeons are used to humans. Uh, you buy some bread, you put it on the floor and the feral pigeons come to you. And we, we sort of colonize a bench with all of our equipment. And so you can catch them like this. <laughs> so it's very it's very fun uh, and you, you attract lots of interest from lots of interesting people uh, as you do this because you can imagine these are very busy areas so we get lots of uh, very drunk people come up to us we get like the police come up to us uh, there are kind of nicer interactions where we have kids and their parents come up and be really excited to see a wild animal so close up um, but it's very cool to do um, and it, it's quite funny because with a lot of birds, when you let them go in the wild, they'll fly in the opposite direction. But the feral pigeons will immediately fly a meter away, turn around and come back for more food <laughs> and elbow all the birds that we want to catch out the way. Um, so that's quite funny. Uh, catching a rock dove is very different and poses uh, slightly different challenges. The, the bird ringers that uh, we work with to sample these uh, doves uh, often use traps. So they're baiting them to seed, usually in their gardens, because they live out in these places. Um, but rock doves are very shy animals. Uh, it's difficult to get within 100 or 200 meters of them. And if I was to go up to Uist or the Outer Hebrides and set up uh, a trap with seed in it, the rock doves would just kind of look at it suspiciously for a week until they managed to trust it enough to go into it. 
Um, so because I'm not very patient, what we did instead was we waited for the birds to go to roost in caves or derelict buildings or barns. Um, and we can go in with a, a giant butterfly net on an extendable pole and a torch. Um, and we're able to catch kind of between 10 and 30 birds uh, per roost site, um, which is often, which is very exciting and fun to do. Uh, we, we usually take them out, uh, we carry them to the car and we process them inside out of the wind and rain. Uh, and then we take them back and we put them back and they happily go to sleep, uh, unbothered by the whole experience. So all of this is done under licensing by the British Trust for Ornithology, by Natural England uh, and by the Home Office. Every bird receives a, an individually numbered leg ring um, to identify it and to make sure we're not resampling the same birds. Um, we also do kind of the standard VTO uh, measurements like wing length and body mass. Uh, and then there are a bunch of measurements that we were interested in to do with head morphology because that keeps cropping up in the kind of rock dove discussion in the literature as something that was potentially uh, interesting. Uh, and then we took DNA samples. So for, for this uh, expedition, uh, we were taking feather DNA samples um, and feathers are not a particularly great source of DNA because like hair, it's dead. Um, but there is some DNA where the red circle is, where the feather's been in contact with the body. So we're able to take that back to the lab in Oxford and do a kind of two or three day uh, sort of cookbook process. But instead of getting something edible at the end, you get this white gunk in a clear liquid. Uh, which is the DNA, which is what you're kind of praying for, for the entire three-day lab process at the end. Uh, the DNA extraction of feathers, um, if you want to look at one or two genes, uh, is quite easy. Uh, but if you want to look at whole genome uh, data, which we needed for the hybridization analyses, it can be a bit more challenging to get enough DNA. So we were very lucky to have uh, the help of Kristen Rueg and Teja Schweizer at Colorado State University who had developed kind of a special step in this DNA extraction sample preparation process, uh, which enabled us to get enough DNA. So then we basically took this white gunk in a clear liquid and we posted it to DNA uh, sequencing facilities and they send you back uh, a file of gigabytes and gigabytes of genetic data, which is then analyzed using the supercomputer that we have at Oxford uh, to ask these questions that we were interested in answering. And so the first of those questions is, do we still have this genetically different uh, wild living lineage um, of pigeon that is distinctive from contemporary feral and wild pigeons? So I wanted you to look first at uh, this plot here, which is a principal component analysis of genomic data. And essentially each individual is a, a little circle and how close it is to the other individuals represents how genetically similar it is. Um, and so something that stands out immediately is if you look at these captive rock doves, something very strange is going on here. They're all coming out as different, or at least some of them are. Um, and this puzzled me for a while until we discussed it with these aviculturists who'd been breeding the rock doves who said, oh yeah, occasionally we do hybridize them with stock doves, um, which explains they have a completely different species in their ancestry, which is why they're popping out as really different. Um, which is interesting on the one hand, but also somewhat compromises the, the conservation value of these captive populations. Uh, if you look, some of these uh, green, uh, not green, uh, orange individuals come into this purple group here. Uh, and this purple group includes all of the domestic breeds, uh, which originated from all over the world. All of the uh, feral pigeons that we caught in England and the Isle of Man and in Lerwick and Shetland. So that means some of these captive rock doves that were in aviaries that had been claimed to be proper rock doves were actually just stock dove hybrid type things. And others uh, were just domestic or feral pigeons that had been maybe uh, inadvertently selected to look a bit like rock doves. Um, so all of that was kind of fairly disappointing, but we do have this group here, which uh, corresponds to all of these rock doves we sampled in the areas which are putatively part of their native range. So, in the Inner Hebrides, the Outer Hebrides, the Highlands and Orkney uh, and Shetland and Cape Clear Island and Republic of Ireland as well. So that was very cool. Um, we then constructed an evolutionary tree, a phylogeny, uh, which is over here, um, in which we rooted it to the hill dove, uh, which is a kind of sister species of the rock dove that lives in Mongolia. Uh, and basically the, the important thing to look at here is that there are two main branches popping out uh, which have strong statistical support, which correspond exactly to, on the one hand, these feral domestic captive animals, 
and on the other hand all of the wild uh, rock debris that we got um and what makes this particularly convincing is that our domestic uh, breeds that we sampled contained a lot of breeds that are hundreds and hundreds of years old uh, that originated in sort of Middle East. So they're very, very old and the rock doves in Scotland are still popping out as completely different to them. So the, the follow-up question to that uh, question was, do we have any rock dove populations uh, that have managed to escape a significant uh, genetic admixture with feral and domestic pigeons? So this was uh, probably the most important thing that we looked at. So we did lots of different genomic analyses. And one of those is this uh, admixture-based analysis. Um, and in this plot, each bar is an individual bird and it's split into purple and green, which uh, in this case represents uh, domestic slash feral and wild rock dove ancestry. So you can see it kind of makes sense that the USA sampled domestic breeds and feral pigeons and the uh, feral pigeons we sampled, and also the captive rock doves are coming out in purple. Um, but excitingly, we do have uh, the Cape Clear Island, which is the Irish population, and all of the Scottish populations of rock doves coming out mostly in green. Um, what is also obvious is that there is a big difference between, for example, Highlands and Orkney, and the Inner Hebrides and Arran, where there is kind of a, a significant chunk of feral pigeon, uh, domestic pigeon ancestry as well and the Outer Hebrides. And so the Outer Hebrides, there's a couple of individuals where there is some potential signal of feral pigeon hybridization, a very small genetic uh, component. Um, but overall, this is uh, the most uh, genetically distinctive population that we currently know of, of wild rock doves. That was very exciting uh, to find. And then how do you tell the differences between these birds? Um, this is another principle component analysis, but in this case, um, each uh, dot or each individual uh, is looking at its head morphology, the different measurements that we took and how close it is uh, to the other individuals represents how similar the head morphology is. And um, so we have this purple group, which is the feral pigeons. Uh, and we have the other group kind of greens and blues, uh, which is the, the wild rock doves that we caught and measured. Um, what does stand out a lot here though, is that there is kind of extensive overlap between these two forms. It's not complete differentiation. Um, and this overlap is mostly driven by the Highlands and Orkney, where we know there's particularly lots of uh, genetic mixture happening. Uh, and what is likely to happen uh, is that over the next few decades, uh, the overlap between these two ellipses will continue to increase in a lot of these places until it completely um, overlaps. And that will be where we say that the, the rock dove has become uh, genetically and uh, phenotypically indistinguishable from the feral pigeon. So we now know First of all, that the, the Outer Hebrides uh, and Scotland in general and Ireland, the rock doves there are genetically distinctive from contemporary feral and domestic pigeons. Uh, we know that depending on where you are, uh, the rock doves vary in the amount of hybridization that they've experienced. Uh, and we know that it's possible to tell the difference morphologically uh, of rock doves from feral pigeons. So what are the next steps? So on the one hand, it will be very interesting um, and very worthwhile to expand this work into, for example, the Faroes or the Mediterranean or North Africa, where we know that there are putative rock populations. Um, and I'm sure that that will happen. Uh, there's been a recent preprint, uh, which has looked at museum specimens from the last century in this species. Um, and they showed that even then the Outer Hebridean and the Scottish populations in general uh, we're standing out as one of the most distinct from feral pigeons. Uh, in my opinion, we have kind of a more uh, exciting opportunity uh, to jump in and look at more in more depth at this outer Hebridean population that we've identified. Um, so I'm starting to set up kind of a monitoring program to look at the basic biology of these populations. Um, and UIST is where we've chosen to set up our study. Uh, there's a lot of rock doves in UIST and it makes up uh, some of the Southern Islands in the Outer Hebrides. Um, the reason why it's such a great place to be uh, if you're a rock dove, uh, and it's also a great place to be if you're a human, I all recommend that you go there, it's great, um, is that we have the, the Western parts of the islands where you can see they're all standing out in very green. Uh, at the Atlantic kind of seaboard side. Um, and this is what we call Maca habitat, which I have almost certainly mispronounced, but is a, it's a Gallic word that refers to this kind of habitat matrix of agricultural lands, sand dunes and meadowlands. Uh, and it's home to lots of cool stuff like corn crakes and breeding wading birds and great yellow bumblebees that we've 
eradicated elsewhere in the UK because of agricultural intensification. Um, and rock doves love to feed in these open meadowlands. The, the rest of the islands you can see is kind of brownish. This is these moorlands, uh, slightly more mountainous areas. Uh, and if you go over to the other side um, where the Hebridean Sea is, there's lots of cliffs and caves which are very inaccessible, which are where the rock doves are able uh, to kind of nest and roost. Um, so it's an ideal place for them to live. Um, a kind of extra bonus for the rock doves is that in the past uh, few, I guess, decades and, and 100 years or so, there have been lots of human constructions and dereliction uh, of buildings, uh, which has allowed uh, the rock doves to essentially get loads of like free bonus caves uh, that are often right in the middle of their feeding zones. Um, so we often kind of camp out and do our work around these buildings. So we have been setting up in order to do all of this basic biology stuff on the rock doves, we need to have a population where we have uh, identifiable individuals. Um, so we've been setting up a ringing project. So the first time I went was in 2019, uh, where I went with my dad and I was really excited to catch 13 birds. Uh, I thought that was very successful. Um, since then, um, we have got a lot better at catching pigeons, and I've now set up this project with Michal Jerski, who is a PhD student at the University of Oxford, um, and we're aiming from 2021, we've been two times a year, once in the spring and once in the autumn, to try and catch up these birds and, and mark them all with rings uh, individually. In the end of 2021, we started colouring uh, as well, uh, and we're kind of trying to work with the local community to recite these birds. Um, to help with survival estimates and things like that. And you can see that the proportion of retraps and resightings that we're getting is starting to increase. Um, we also have started uh, camera trapping in some of the roost sites, um, which uh, on the one hand has helped us a lot to get more coloring resightings of these birds. Um, and you can also see that uh, it's given us many, many hours of footage of rock doves like flirting with each other, which seems to be what they do like 95% of the time. Um, so I think, I don't know who he's flirting with, but his actual like wife is in the background sitting on a nest, so she doesn't seem very impressed. Um, and so kind of the, the first thing that I wanted to look at in the wild rock dove and what I wanted to finish with, because it's the most recent thing that we've done, is looking at rock dove movements, because feral and domestic pigeons, we know, we know a little bit about feral pigeon movement and we know a lot about domestic pigeon uh, movements. Um, but we didn't really know what the rock doves are doing, how they're using this landscape. And then a lot of this old kind of gentleman naturalist based literature would mention something called a commuting flight, um, which is supposed to be a very characteristic behavior of wild rock doves, which is when they will leave their roosting cave uh, in the morning, they'll fly up to 20, 30 kilometers every day out to the meadowlands to feed, and then they'll fly back at night. Um, what I was interested in was because we have all of these buildings within the feeding uh, area, do they have to do these commuting flights anymore? Um, and the reason that's interesting is because when we think about the kind of pathway to domestication in this animal, some people would say what we did was we went out to caves and we took chicks and we directly domesticated them. But it's also possible that they kind of moved into us as humans and gave up commuting and then we kind of just rolled with it and accepted them um, as they were as a source of food. So we got funding from the British Birds Charitable Trust to tag uh, seven uh, birds. Um, we got data from five of these birds due to various kind of uh, logistical and technological issues. Um, and these were tagged in a kind of disused building on a croft uh, right on the edge of the Maca habitat in North Uist. Um, and so these are the, the first GPS results. Um, you are the first set of people to see these. Um, and you can see that essentially they're not doing anything. They're not, they are not commuting at all. Um, the, the tags were on the birds for between uh, a week and a month, uh, and we've got hundreds of data points. Um, and not once did any of these five individuals move more than two kilometers from its roost site. Uh, not only are they not doing that, they are also not uh, commuting in the sense that they're leaving in the morning, feeding in the field all day, coming back. They're just kind of sitting on the roost all day, occasionally flying to feed for an hour, fly back, have a sort of chill on the top of the building, fly back again. So it's completely different to what was understood in the past as being the, this very characteristic behavior uh, of the wild rock dove. Um, so that's very exciting. And, and kind of the hope is that we're going to start tagging some more uh, and looking into this a bit more and seeing if the cave dwelling populations are actually commuting. <laughs> 
so to sum up, we know that these birds are special now. We know that genetically we have these distinctive populations uh, and they're very cool. Uh, and we also know that uh, because of a historical lack of interest, they're basically a blank slate for a lot of aspects of science. Uh, there's a lot more to learn about them. Uh, so that's why for me, uh, it's one of the most exciting birds that we're, we have in the UK. So I wanted to finish by, uh, first of all, the most important people to thank are all the bird ringers um, and who helped catch the birds. Um, all of the people who took pictures uh, for citizen science, uh, which was useful because without those people, there's no way we'd be able to get enough uh, samples. Um, I'd like to thank all of the people up in Scotland and especially the crofters in the Outer Hebrides um, because they're very patient with us when we kind of knock on their doors and say, can we bother the pigeons living next to you in your shed at midnight with a torch and a big nut? Um, and then I'd like to acknowledge all the different scientists who have kind of taught me how to do all these different aspects, whether it's uh, looking at the genomics uh, and the laboratory work, uh, looking at disease in the rock derbs, or teaching me how to put a GPS tag on a pigeon. Um, and then finally, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that we've re received lots of kind of generous funding from all of these different organizations who have uh, helped us to, to cover all of the field work and uh, sequencing that we've been doing. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for that fascinating one. I think I've now got my next holiday destination and know never to yeah, yeah. invest a million pounds. <laughs> a fine You're out for colour roots. Um, before we go online to see if there are any questions, are there any in the room that anyone has for Will? Isabel has a microphone, so we'll see how we go. We might need to repeat the questions mm -hmm. for those online before we answer if that's all right. Will, there we go. Hello, I'm Howard Froding, I'm a botanist, not a, not a zoologist. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> one question that popped up in my mind was um, do we know how long the rock dog has existed from the outer heavens? Has it arrived from mainland Europe, or mm -hmm. what do we know about that? Yeah, so the question was about, um, do we know how long the rock dove has been present uh, on the Outer Hebrides and where it's come from? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely been there for um, since the Middle Ages because people have dug like middens and things. Um, what is interesting about the distribution of the rock dove and kind of an extra layer of confusion is that we're not sure to what extent it's kind of followed human agriculture as we've expanded out. Um, so, for example, in St Kilda, we know that when the people evacuated and uh, St Kilda became uninhabited, the rock dust died off very quickly. Uh, so to some extent, it's clear that they, they do now need uh, agriculture. But we also know that uh, rock doves were present in Gibraltar in caves alongside Neanderthals who didn't farm. Um, so we know in some places they don't require kind of modern humans to live around. Um, so it basically needs people to go and do some more like archaeological stuff in the Outer Hebrides to look for more uh, samples, but we don't know, essentially. <laughs> right, so um, I have some keys, but I don't think we're going to see the videos. But still, I'm very interested and I have a question, which is what type of aspects do you think stop the hybridization between different populations that might be or something like that? Is it just a location or might it be other like things? Well? Yeah, so the, the question is about what might stop hybridization in, in some areas, but not others. Um, and if we look in uh, Scotland, I think it's quite clear that uh, between like Shetland and Orkney and uh, Caithness, this kind of line that we have on the East Coast, that is often where people race pigeons from. From Shetland to mainland Scotland and they're getting lost a lot of the time and joining up these wild populations. It's also, uh, we know that for example Orkney has a quite a long uh, tradition of keeping pigeons for meat so there's lots of old, uh, they call them ducats and it, it's spelled ducot and it means dovecot uh, and so they've been there for a very long time but in the Outer Hebrides you don't see those old dovecots so they've clearly not been keeping domestic pigeons and also in the Outer Hebrides the prevailing wind is like smashing in from the Atlantic all the time. So any feral pigeon that decides it wants to like go on holiday to Uist is going to get very quickly 
pushed back to mainland Scotland. But I think all it takes is, you know, someone to decide they want to take up pigeon keeping in, in US and that would not stop them. The weather would not save them. Um, so online, um, and sticking with um, being up north, are there rock doves on St Kilda and do we know their genetic status? Yes, yeah, so um, there were rock doves on St Kilda um, when there were people there. But ever since the, the people were evacuated um, for kind of various, uh, it's a slightly sad story and there's no one living there anymore other than a military base and, and the, the staff of the National Trust for Scotland. The rock doves died off very quickly uh, after people did. Um, so they were clearly only able to be there because the people were farming and they were fed in that way. I think there's nothing else for them to for them to feed there. So occasionally rock doves do turn up. So maybe once every two years, the National Trust for Scotland people will very excitedly spot a rock dove that's landed there, but they don't tend to hang around. Um, but so they're, they're the same, but they'll probably have come from US. So the genetic status will be the, the same as the US birds. Yeah. Um, and then continuing on the theme that, you know, potential extinction by hybridisation, we have another question from Julianne saying, are the wild birds protected by law? I'm assuming not. But... The wild birds are technically protected okay. and feral pigeons are on the general licence, so are in many ways not protected. But how are you going to prove if you've shot a, a rock dove that it's a feral pigeon? I think there, there was a, a case I don't know, like maybe two or three decades ago in the Outer Hebrides where a crofter was shooting the rock doves and succeeded, I think, in court of saying, how do you know they're rock doves? They could be feral pigeons. Um, so I think it's very difficult. I don't think that human um, hunting pressure actually affects them that much, though, mm -hmm. because I think in the past when they were not protected, you have all of these older Hebrideans who would say, oh, yeah, when I was allowed, we used to go into the caves and kill 300 of them. Uh, for, for food and stuff and that didn't affect them so I think even if there's a certain amount of kind of illegal killing still going on it's not the problem the problem for rock doves is feral pigeon expansion yeah. Do you have any more? Oh, sorry Isabel yeah. thank you um, on the ferrets mm -hmm. um, probably where you're really spotting rock dove yeah. and you see it's spotting rock dove they don't vary much there are the spotting or what we would consider a rock dove. Yeah. But there is a small population of the leaf from the two Yeah. Um, it's really thought about how the spotting ones came down. Yeah, so the, the question is about the fact that if you go to the Faroe Islands, um, there's lots of speckled uh, pigeons within the population. Uh, do we know how that happened? Um, and for a very long time, some of the literature about the Faroes would say that the population there is dimorphic, like guillemots or anything, and that we have kind of this melanistic, spotty uh, population and the natural blue bar ones. And that it was suggested that this was natural variation within the rock dove population. Um, but ever since, we, we now know that this speckled morph originated under domestication through hybridization with the African speckled pigeon. So it, it can't really have got there naturally unless for some reason the African speckled pigeon avoided you know all of Scotland and Ireland and got up to the Faroes so it's likely that 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 comes from domestication and domestic pigeons there I think from from when I've looked kind of briefly at uh, pictures of rock doves in the Faroes they they seem to be of a similar plumage status than they are in Orkney and um, so likely their genetics is also kind of forming this hybrid swarm where most individuals to some extent have admixed ancestry but it would be cool to do genetic work on the pharaohs rock doves as well. Thank you. So sticking with genomes, um, do we have genomes of wild birds from a long time ago from old museum specimens to compare with current publications? I think you did. Yeah, so the, there is a brand new uh, preprint, which is not peer reviewed yet, where they have specimens from uh, sort of the last 150 years, some of the specimens which were collected by Darwin. Uh, and they looked at them. Uh, they've not yet done a direct comparison, which will be something that I'm sure uh, we'll get around to quite soon. Um, but it was clear that even then, the Outer Hebrides and the Scottish populations are popping out as some of the most different. Uh, and that because they sampled them from Tring, uh, from that collection, they were able to have rock doves from all over uh, North Africa, all over Europe, all over Asia. And still the Outer Hebrides in Scotland were popping out as the most kind of interesting for, for our purposes. It's funny you mentioned Darwin because I'm sure his head would just yeah. he's watching us. <laughs> it's a bit daunting up there, isn't it? But I think I think just now the technology that we have and, and yeah. how much more we can do today, especially with you know the tracking. Yeah. Um, I think you'd be very happy now. <laughs> um, 
Okay, I'm gonna whilst you move over there as well, I'm just gonna ask a very quick one. Um, how sure are you of the accuracy of the data that you are using to assess population numbers? Um, the data that we're using is not assessing population numbers, it's genetic data. Um <laughs> It's really difficult to, to assess population size in, in wild rock doves. So in the US, we'd really like to do it. My kind of uh, pulling a number out of nowhere estimate is between one and 3,000 rock doves. Uh, mm -hmm. But the reason it's difficult is because a lot of the places where they're nesting are so inaccessible. Yes. So in caves and cliffs where it's just not safe at all to, to go and look. Uh, and we don't know what proportion of the individuals are using natural cave sites versus contemporary human buildings. So. It is an interesting question how to, to work out the population size of these birds, but we're working on it. We've got an... Hello. Um, a slightly different question. Why do you think they went into the domestication process for the dog and came out as a fish? Just in terms of the history of the naming and stuff, why, why do you think that occurred? I have no idea why that, that happened. I know that the uh, the Americans rebranded them for, for several years back to being rock pigeons because they, they it was decided that uh, we tend to call the kind of bigger gray looking things pigeons and the smaller, more delicate looking things doves. Um, and so they looked at what the British were calling a rock dove and said, no, you're all wrong, that's a pigeon and tried to officially rebrand it. But then I think a couple of years ago, people thought, no, it's a rock dove. We've called it that for ages, we'll have it back. So it's become back to being a dove. So I think it, it's, it's all very political, what's a pigeon and what's a dove. We've got one here. Is there another one? I better, okay, I'll get the people. I was going to ask one question. You mentioned rings and a board of yours. One of the things that overlay the economics and some of the stuff that's being recycled over Britain. So it's a bit more historical and more. Maybe. I just have to repeat. Uh, so can we, yes. sorry, what was it? Proteomics. The, the question is whether we can use these middens in places like the Outer Hebrides uh, and look at uh, proteomics and other kind of modern technologies and, and ask deeper questions about rock dove's genetic history. Um, this, is, this is a bit beyond my area of expertise. Um, I think it would be very difficult having seen how challenging it is to get uh, significant quantities of DNA out of feathers from contemporary populations to do it from uh, historical populations that long ago, uh, which will have been mixed with all different birds and, and contaminated. I know that it is going to be possible to get some DNA from there, but I don't know whether it would be enough to look at uh, these, you know, really high throughput sequencing for things like hybridization analysis. Uh, but again, it's not my area of expertise. <laughs> Which I think answers another question. So, is there a significant population of feral pigeons in the outer Hebrides? And if so, how is hibernation not happening there? So, yeah, so there's not there really. The, the only reason that the, the they are still there is that there is a small population in Stornoway uh, on Lewis, and there are maybe two individuals in the entirety of South Uist versus potentially. Uh, one to 5,000 rock doves across the whole of the Outer Hebrides. So the rock dove population there is healthy enough that it has some kind of, it can absorb this without mm -hmm. too much of a problem. Uh, it's if people started to keep pigeons and have a collection that was leaking into the wild over a prolonged period of time that it would start to pose an issue. Um, okay, and then we have a little bit more of a, well, slightly fun question because I think all of us were fascinated at how to catch a pigeon, yeah. um, especially <laughs> a fair one. Did you handle urban pigeons with your bare hands? Yes. If so, how did you handle assessed risk of parasitic or disease transmission? So I think feral pigeons do have a slightly unfortunate reputation for, for not being very clean, but I don't know whether it's fair to suggest that a feral pigeon is more of a disease risk than a lot of other birds that we handle as bird ringers uh, all over the world. So there, there are, you know, you always make sure you're washing your hands, you're always using uh, alcohol sanitizer, and there's lots of precautions that are taken now around bird flu. Um, but I don't know whether there's any special things that we did around feral pigeons. Um, although that that is what scared the police officer who came up and said, put the pigeon down. Uh, and I said, no. And he kind of shuffled up and said, well, make sure you wash your hands then. And <laughs> Um, and then I think 
the final question that we have online, has work been done to compare and contrast their amazing homing and other mental abilities with those of wood pigeons? Which might be slightly outside. Uh, I don't think wood pigeons. I'm, I'm not a behavioral scientist, but I don't think wood pigeons have been directly compared with feral pigeons. I'm looking at, I'm looking at a behavioral scientist. <laughs> I don't think so. I think uh, even comparing domestic pigeons and wild rock doves is, is very much in its infancy in behavioral terms. And I guess also stock doves would be cool to look at. Um, but no, I don't think that's happened yet. Okay. Think we're doing okay for time. Were there any final questions on the floor? No. So I think all that remains me to do is to thank you so much, Will, for a really, really wonderful, um, fun, but yeah. a, you know, serious talk, um, especially when it comes to considering um, extinction by hybridisation. Um, thank you for having me. But um, thank you also to the British Ornithologist Club um, for organising um, this meeting. Thank you to everybody who has also turned up in the room. It's wonderful to, I think, have um, a lecture again in person as opposed to watching lectures on Zoom as well. So thank you very much. As a treat for those who are in the room, um, you are welcome to make your way upstairs to the library for the, um, the drinks reception. Um, there is also the wonderful Wallace display that the collection staff have put on that still um, is on display. And for those of you who are online, you can still get to see the Wallace display if you did want to come to the Linnaean Society, um, which is open between on Tuesday to Friday, 10 to 5, but unfortunately no wine is available uh, <laughs> on those days. And so that was not being her head at least. So, um, but no, otherwise, again, thank you so much, Will. It's been wonderful having thanks. you here. And, um, <laughs>